Before COVID-19 sent most of us home to work, the workplace was already rapidly transforming. With multiple generations in the workforce, we were enabling different work styles, designing innovative workspaces, and implementing integrated workflows. But in the current environment, the way we work has completely changed. We are all working remotely from home. We are all going through a cultural shift and adapting to this new style of working. Home has become our workspace, and we are using integrated workflows to keep our business running. To help companies navigate this new reality, join Cisco WebEx for a live Future of Work marathon series with customers and industry experts. The future of work is now. If you want to sign up, go to virtualsummit.webex.com. Again, that's virtualsummit.webex.com and use the hashtag remotework. Also, I just released my free Future Leader Masterclass where you can learn the skills and mindsets that 140 of the world's top CEOs say are crucial for future leaders. Get access for free at futureleadermasterclass.com. I'm making the case that it's tremendously important that we shift upstream, not just in businesses, but, but in society. And two, that it's not easy. And there's a lot of important reasons why it's not easy, but we've got to be willing to, to shoulder that burden and go anyway, because the rewards are too profound. And when we are recording this, we're right in the middle of the coronavirus episode, which of course uh, is a failure of upstream work. Like we're, right now we're putting out fires that we never needed to put out if things had been handled a little differently. Uh, and so that's, that's the gist of the book. That is Dan Heath best-selling author of several books, including his newest one, Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen, which came out last month. For those of you who have been listening to the show for a while, you may remember my interview with Dan's brother, Chip, back in January of 2018. Today, our conversation centers around Dan's new book, and it is a topic I think most of us can relate to. Most organizations are stuck in an endless cycle of putting out fires or reacting to one emergency after the other. But what Dan examines in his book is how do we get to the root cause of these fires to stop them from ever happening to begin with. You will hear how we can move from downstream thinking, where we handle one problem after the other, to upstream thinking, where we deal with the systems that cause these problems. Dan also shares three main barriers to upstream thinking, why focus is an ally and an enemy inside of organizations, how he and his brother go about writing books, his take on the value of MBAs, and much more. This woman told me she had just been moved physically within her office, so she had just like taken over a new desk, and her desk was right by a stairwell door, you know, and they're often reinforced, uh, so they're heavy doors. And this thing just creaked like crazy, and it, it, it drove her nuts. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of the people around had kind of adapted to it. And a couple of days of this thing just distracting her, she finally just brought in a can of WD-40 from home and, and generously lubed up the hinges on the door. All of a sudden it was quiet, just, you know, perfectly quiet. And she said her uh, office mates treated her like she had come down from on high. They were just in awe that she had solved this problem. It, and I think that's a great example of where our capacity to adapt as human beings is actually maybe a little bit overpowerful. Welcome to the Future of Work with Jacob Morgan, where every week I speak with the world's top business leaders, executives, and authors. From leadership to employee experience to the future of work, this is where you will get the insights, the tools, and the inspiration you need to succeed and thrive at work and in life. If you want to future-proof your career and your organization, then this is the show for you. My brand new book, The Future Leader, which is based on interviews with 140 CEOs around the world, explores the top skills and mindsets for future leaders, and it's out now. You can grab a copy at getfutureleaderbook.com. If you want to get in touch with me about sponsoring the show or having me keynote your next event, you can visit thefutureorganization.com or email me directly, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Lastly, if you get a few seconds, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show, and I personally appreciate it. 
Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today is Dan Heath, and he's the author of a brand new book called Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. And he's also the co-author of several other books, which I'm sure you've heard of, that he published with his brother Chip, including The Power of Moments, Made to Stick and Switch. Dan, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Jacob. And uh, before before I hit the record button, I was mentioning I, I had your brother as a uh, guest on the podcast. I think it was mid or late last year. So now now I got uh, the whole family. Well, you're missing a sister in between, so you'll need to book her for something. Oh, uh, um, we're gonna. Oh yeah, we'll have. But to... yeah, you're working our. You're working your way through the Heath siblings. That's then, great. Then we'll get the parents. We'll get whoever we can on here. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to um, uh, to speak with me today. And I, I had the opportunity to read your new book, which was great. Thank um, you. The very first thing that I noticed that I wanted to ask you about is your dedication. Because <laughs> the dedication said, to my brother Chip, who kept me out of law school. And I suspect that there's a story there. And I <laughs> I really want to find out what, what that story is. There is indeed. Yeah. So I... Um... I went to the University of Texas for undergrad, and uh, I majored in liberal arts, which is, you know, of course, the most marketable major that they have. And and right about the senior year, it started to dawn on me that, hey, wait a second, I'm actually going to have to learn earn a living at some point in the near future. And so in the tradition of, of liberal arts graduates, I thought, well, I'll just go to law school. That'll be the solution to that. And so I applied to law school, got accepted. I actually moved up to Chicago. I was going to go to University of Chicago Law School, um, partly because my brother lived up there. And my My brother brother convinced me. He thought thought this was a terrible idea. idea. He He thought thought that I would not enjoy enjoy being a lawyer, lawyer, that 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 wasn't what I should do. Uh, And and I kind of thought he was right, but I also had had enough practicality that I just felt like, well, I got to do something. I might as well do this. And so he convinced me to defer for a year. And he said, I will, I'll pay for your apartment for a year in Chicago and you can do some projects. Maybe we'll do some projects together and we'll just figure out, is there some other path for you other than law school? And if there's not, then you just start the next fall. Well, that was irresistible to me as a 22 year old or whatever I was. And so we did, uh, he's 10 years older. So he was, uh, yeah, he was 32. And, and so we did. We did a bunch of projects together. Uh, we actually worked on some really interesting stuff, but nothing that like panned out as a profession. Uh, but, but part of what came out of that was I ended up getting a job for a guy named Doug Drain, who would later provide me with seed funding for an entrepreneurial idea I had. And about two months before law school started, this guy, Doug Drain, uh, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, if you'll blow off law school and help me with this thing, I'll give you the seed money that you've been wanting for for your entrepreneurial idea. So anyway, Chip was the person who set in motion this chain of events that successfully kept me out of law school, and I've been grateful ever since for that uh, that intervention. And so that's that's the, the the gist of the dedication. Wow, I love that story. So how did so? Okay, that's uh, when you were 22. You um you had that um that startup. How did you go from there to where you are now? It was a very um, meandering and, and uh, ill-strategized path, I think. Um, I worked on the business I referred to that I got seed funding for. is called ThinkWell. It actually still exists today. It's a, um, it's a publisher of college textbooks that are digital. And the format is radically different. Uh, it, it, if you are familiar with the Khan Academy, it's sort of like the Khan Academy before there was a Khan Academy. Like we would go around and find the most interesting, the most dynamic professors in the country. And uh, instead of learning calculus or biology or something from a thousand page boring textbook, you could learn from these short video lectures from the most interesting professors in the country. That was that was the pitch. And so I did that for about four or five years. I decided uh, I want to go out and kind of broaden my knowledge. Uh, I had started this thing with no knowledge of business whatsoever and just kind of picked up what I could on the fly. And so I went to Harvard Business School to get an MBA. After that, uh, I did some work in executive education at Duke. And and then right around that time, Made to Stick came out. That was our first book. That was in uh, 2007. And to to no one's greater surprise than ours, it was a hit. 
like we were uh, the first week the book came out, we were on the Today Show. And uh, and, and so all of a sudden this, this door opened in the universe that I never imagined would open where we could keep writing. And in fact, we could do that for a living and speak about what we've written about. And, and that's been my life ever since. All right. So I have a very candid question for you. Yeah. Um, do you think your Harvard MBA was worth it? Because <laughs> that's I, probably I get, a longer conversation. Well, because I get a lot of people on the show that are that are very mixed on this, and I get some academics and professors, and then I get other people, um, and there's very different perspectives on what's going to happen to top tier universities if it's worth to get an MBA, or if organizations don't care about it anymore. And there's this really big debate that's going on and these different sides are emerging. And so as somebody who did get an MBA from a top tier university, if you could go back, would you have done it again? Or did you not think that it was as necessary for where you are now? Boy, the, the career journey of Dan Heath. I hope, you're, uh, I hope your listeners are, are fascinated by this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would do it again if I could go back, but, but maybe not for the reasons you expect. I think I just needed that. Um, transition point in my career. I needed to kind of step out of what I was doing and, and think about it and be uh, thoughtful about what came next. And so it was almost like I just needed a time out that didn't look like a two year gap on my resume. Um, I'm not, I, I have to admit, I'm pretty skeptical about the value of an MBA curriculum. I think that, uh, uh, you know, just one of the things that cracked me up was I think there were something like three Enron cases in the Harvard Business School curriculum uh, two years before we started and they were very quickly kind of vanished out of the curriculum <laughs> when Enron blew up. And and so I think there's a lot of, uh, I, I do think there's some science and some knowledge to business. I mean, with accounting and finance and other things like that, I, I think there's, there's a lot that's hard to teach and a lot that's kind of fad chasing. So I'm not sure the reason to go get an MBA is to make you more skillful at business. But I do think there's tremendous win in, in the credential, you know, uh, especially for certain careers. Like if you want to go into venture capital or private equity or hedge funds or whatever, clearly uh, you're going to need the credential that MBAs offer. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's my career advice to you out there. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. you. <laughs> um, so you've written several books uh, with your brother. And where, where did these ideas for these books come from? Like, do you have a certain process that you take when trying to come up with a topic and then researching it to create a book? We really don't. I mean, the first, the first three books were made to stick switch and decisive and, and they kind of grew out of each other organically. Like we always seem to know what was next for those first three. Our, our fourth book, The Power of Moments was the first where we set about consciously trying to figure out, Hey, what's the next topic? And, and our approach was, I think this was a good approach. Um, it's something we advised in our decision making book. And so we kind of took our own medicine. Our approach was to try to get multiple things going at once so that we wouldn't fall in love with a bad idea, uh, it, and, and wouldn't suffer from the sunk cost fallacy where you, you know, put in six months on something and you, you so hate to flush it that you're not, uh, willing to walk away. And so I think we avoided that trap and in fact did exactly that. We had a couple of ideas that we probably put in somewhere between four and eight months on, uh, researching, thinking, um, kind of uh, synthesizing, and then just decided, mm, I don't know if this is worth another couple of years of our life and just flushed it, you know, literally got n nothing out of it, not even an article. But I think that was good discipline because when we hit upon the moments topic, uh, we, we just kind of knew, we knew it was right. Um, I think for us, the topics you know, we're, we're not artists. We're not, uh, we're not chasing, you know, our own expression. We're trying to help people. And so we need books that are practical. We need books that, that people can read and know how to do something different, but also that are entertaining. Um, you know, this is not, uh, you know, DOS for dummies books either. I mean, we want people to be able to read these books and, and be able to keep flipping the chapters at night and not feel like it's homework. Uh, and so there's a blend there where you're looking for some science, some great stories, some practicality, and, and the, the intersection of those things is kind of where we want to live. And this new book that you wrote, th is this the first book that you've written uh, by yourself without your It mother? is. Yeah. So I, I jettisoned Chip, you know, <laughs> the, the weak link in the chain. And, no, I'm kidding. No. So we, uh, we wrote Power of Moments, and, and basically it was, it was a very simple situation. Chip was not 
that eager to dive right back into the the writing and research cycle. Um, and I was, I mean, this is, this is what I love more than anything. And I think Chip, Chip has more interest than I do and got involved in a bunch of different stuff, including, uh, including a gig at, uh, Google X, their moonshot factory. And so, um, so this was an idea that had been in the back of my head for, for over a decade. I mean, I started a file with the name upstream, which is the name of the book back in 2009. And there were, were a couple of things that happened back in that era that really, um, uh, planted this seed. And, and the first was I heard a parable that's well known in public health. And it's actually the very first thing in the book. And the parable goes like this. You and a friend are having a picnic on uh, the bank of a river. And you've just laid down your picnic blanket. You're about to have your meal when you hear a shout from the direction of the river. And you look back and there's a child thrashing around in the water, apparently drowning. So you both dive in, you fish the child out, you bring them to shore. And just as you're starting to calm down, you hear another shout. You look back, there's a second child splashing around, again, apparently drowning. And so back in you go, you fish them out. Then there are two more children come along right behind. And so begins this kind of revolving door of rescue where you're in and out and fishing kids out and it's exhausting work. And right about that time, you notice your friend is swimming to the shore, steps out, starts to walk away as though to leave you alone. And you you cry out, hey, where are you going? I need your help. All these kids are drowning. And your friend says, I'm going upstream to figure out who's throwing all these kids in the river. And that, in a nutshell, is what this book is about. It's about this trap that we fall in, in life and in work, where we're always reacting to things. You know, we're putting out fires. We're responding to emergencies. And, and it's like we're always dealing with the crisis of the day, but we never make the time to go up to the systems level and figure out how might we have prevented the problems that occupy so much of our time and attention. So, so that was kind of the, the origin of this word upstream and, and the way we'll be using in this conversation is the idea that, that we can stop problems before they happen. I love that story. So you, you first heard this in 2009 and you've been collecting and doing research on it ever since then? Exactly right. And in wow. fact, I knew really early that that there was enough meat here and, and enough interest. I mean, as a writer, you got to keep yourself interested, and in this case, for, for 10 plus years. Within a month or so of hearing that parable, I had another conversation with a, with a police chief. He was a deputy police chief of a Canadian city, and he had this wonderful thought experiment we were talking about something totally different, and this came up, and immediately I connected it to the upstream parable. He said, imagine you've got two police officers, and one of them decides to go downtown uh, during the morning commute when things get really crazy, and she goes to this one intersection that is chaotic and where a lot of accidents happen. And just by making herself visible in that intersection, she makes drivers a little more cautious, a little more careful. They slow down, and there are fewer accidents. So that's the first officer. And then the second officer goes to a different part of downtown where there is a forbidden right turn. And she hides around the corner and waits for drivers to try to sneak a right turn. And then she nabs them and gives them a ticket. And the deputy chief said, which of these officers do you think did more to protect public safety and public health? And he said, you know, it's got to be the first officer. She was in a place where she may have prevented accidents and even prevented death. But if you ask which of these officers will be promoted, which of these officers will be praised, which of these officers will be rewarded, it's the second one because she's coming back with this stack full of tickets. You know, and that's the, the evidence that she accomplished something. And meanwhile, that first officer, how would you even demonstrate that you did anything? You know, how do you prove that something did not happen? You know, there's a guy who was driving to work that morning and he saw her at that intersection and slowed down and unbeknownst to him, he would have been in a wreck if it weren't for her there. In an alternate world, he would have gone to the hospital with a serious injury, but he doesn't know that. And, 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 and the, the officer problem. certainly doesn't either. It, it, there's, a, there's a kind of ambiguity to upstream victories where sometimes when we succeed, we may not even be able to prove that we've succeeded. And so that, that thought experiment just kind of um, 
uh, just stuck in my mind. And, and, you know, the connection to the upstream side, that, that parable that I shared is so clear. It's like, um, if, if those two people were having a picnic and no kids came by, would they even be aware that anything had been accomplished, you know, that any problem had been solved or would yeah. they have just taken it for granted? So those were the initial origins of the idea. So uh, it sounds like upstream is finding, um, like you said, kind of the problem with the system, whereas downstream is more like the fighting fire approach. Exactly right. Yeah. It's, downstream is there's a fire in your house and somebody needs to come put it out. Upstream is how do we keep houses and buildings from catching on fire? And so, they, they require very different skill sets. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I, and so I guess the challenge for a lot of people listening is how do we move from downstream thinking to more of the upstream thinking, which is um, most of you know what you cover in the book. Yeah, and and that's exactly why why I wrote the book is is to cover that topic exactly. And 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 if I could characterize the book at a really high level. It's basically number one. I'm making the case that it's tremendously important that we shift upstream, not just in businesses, but but in society, and two that. It's not easy. And there's a lot of important reasons why it's not easy, but we've got to be willing to to shoulder that burden and go anyway, because the rewards are too profound. And when we are recording this, we're right in the middle of the coronavirus episode, which of course uh, is a failure of of upstream work. Like we're right now we're putting out fires that we never needed to put out if things had been handled a little differently. Uh, And so that's, that's the gist of the book. This is hard work. And I want to, I want you to know why it's hard work, but it's work that has profound returns. Can you give an example of um, something in an organization, just to kind of bring it back? Because a lot of people listening to this are, you know, working for organizations. Just something to make this um, real. An example. Yeah, let's get this tangible. Yeah. Yeah. No, something I, I, I get it. Downstream versus upstream. And and to be clear, I mean, I think a lot of the thing that, that brought me to this topic were more social, but um, but there's a lot of business in this book as well. In fact, the first story in the book is about Expedia, the travel site that um, back in 2012, a guy named Ryan O'Neill, who worked in the customer experience group, he was looking through some data from the call center. So Expedia, of course, is an online site, but they do have a call center where if something goes wrong with your reservation, you can call a 1-800 number and get a human being on the phone. And so back in 2012, Ryan O'Neill had discovered that for every 100 people who book a flight on Expedia, 58 of them were calling the call center for some kind of help, which is just mind blowing, right? That that the whole point of this thing is to allow for self-service. And yet almost six out of 10 people who book online are ending up calling for something. And so Ryan O'Neill, you know, scratches his head. He starts going through the data. Why are all these people calling us? Turns out the number one reason that people are calling is to get a copy of their itinerary. 20 million calls were placed in 2012. 20 million for people just asking for a copy of the reservation that they had booked. I mean, that's like every man, woman, and child in Florida calling Expedia in one year. And so Ryan O'Neill's like, this is, this is nuts. We got to do something about this. And he and his boss, they, um, they present this to the CEO at that time, and, and they said, um, you know, we've got to convene a task force to get customers to stop calling us. It's an expensive problem. At five bucks a call, you know, the itinerary problem alone is a $100 million problem. And so they did. They created a war room to kind of tick these off one at a time, go through the top uh, reasons people are calling. And, and the fixes are not complicated. You know, you you give people a self-service option online and you change the way that you send emails so that not so many of them end up in the spam folder and on and on. So it's not a complicated problem. I think what's interesting for our purposes is how this problem manifested in the first place, because you would think that there would be some kind of natural alarm bell once you hit like the eight millionth call for an itinerary. That, you know, a red light would have gone off on some executive's desk. We got to do something about this, but it didn't. And, and the reason is, it, it's very simple when you think about it, that Expedia, like virtually every company, is divided into functions and silos. You know, so there's a marketing team and it's their job to get people to the Expedia site and to come there rather than to Kayak or somewhere else. And then there's a product team that designs such a smooth 
interface that it kind of funnels people to a transaction once they're on the site. And then there's a tech team that, that pays attention to, to uptime and making sure everything's humming along smoothly. And then there's the call center team. And, and how are they measured? They want to get people off the phone as quick as they can while still keeping them happy. And, and all those silos, when I talk about their goals, they all kind of make sense, right? You can nod your head and say, well, that does make sense that the marketing team does that, the call center does that. But if you ask the question, whose job is it to make sure that customers don't need to call? The answer is nobody. It's none of those people's job. And in fact, none of them would even be rewarded if that were to happen. And so that's an example of the kind of problem that slips between the silos that emerge in organizations where this focus on specialization means it's very easy to solve problems that have clear ownership. Like whose job is it to respond to Jacob when he calls wanting his itinerary? Well, it's the call center's job. In fact, it's, it's one agent in the call center's job. It's simple. Just like if your house is on fire, whose job is it to put it out? The fire department. But when you ask these, these more complex questions, like whose job is it to prevent a customer from calling? That's the upstream question. How can we prevent this problem from ever happening? A lot of times you get distributed ownership. And a lot of times distributed ownership can mean no ownership and no action. Just as when we ask the question, how do we keep your house from uh, catching on fire? That's a complicated answer. You know, well, the, the homeowner is slightly involved. The fire department slightly involved. The people who write the building codes are slightly involved. And, and the net net is probably no one owns it and, and nothing happens. And so those are the kinds of, of things that can happen within organizations and, and what I love about the Expedia story is it's both the before and the after. It's like we can understand what happened before to lead them into this pickle, but they also successfully conquered this by going upstream. So those 20 million calls these days are zero. I mean, they, they completely vanquished this problem. Why is this so hard for companies to figure out? Because it sounds very commonsensical, if that's a word, mm -hmm. that you just are basically looking for what is causing the problem. I mean, that's, I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that, right? What is causing the problem as opposed to just like, we keep having these problems, you know, whack-a-mole, for example, uh, instead of just trying to hit the mole, trying to figure out why, why do these stupid moles keep popping back up all the time? Um, I think it, it's, I think it's a problem of levels. So you're right. It's just a matter of solving problems, but, it, but the, the, the key thing is there's an asterisk, asterisk there, which is, which problem are you solving? So the people in the call center, what have they been told? They've been told you're going to be rewarded if your average call time goes down and your uh, you know, net promoter score, however they're managing customer happiness, goes up. And so when they're on a call with you, you're calling about your itinerary. Their goal is they, they, want, they want to butter you up and make you happy and get you that itinerary lickety split. And, and that's what success looks like to them. But there's no natural reason for them to be thinking, hey, how could we have kept Jacob from calling? I mean, that's just something that's kind of outside of their experience as it's been defined for them. And so that's a point I make in the book is that focus – in organizations is both an enemy and an ally. It's an ally in the sense that when, when we get people focused on particular measures or a particular area of responsibility, it makes them more efficient. I mean, they were successful at Expedia at reducing the average call time. They were getting better because of that focus. But focus is also an enemy in the sense that it blinds you to things that are just slightly outside of your box, like the question, why are people calling at all? And so I think that's the that's the trap that we have to urge from is, is making sure to be careful how we're defining the problems that we're solving. Is there a place for downstream thinking or are you arguing that we should just completely remove it and only focus on the upstream stuff? <laughs> no, definitely not. No, I, I think that, that we will always want downstream solutions. I mean, when, when, when your kid is, is drowning in the public pool, you'll want the lifeguard there to fish them out. And, and when your house is on fire, you'll want the fire department. So I, I am not at all a skeptic of, of downstream solutions. But I'm just pointing out what I think is the obvious, which is that we spend about 99% of our time downstream, even when we stand to gain a ton by just shifting even incremental attention upstream. It's like the Expedia story where they're just burning – you know, 100 million bucks a year answering calls that they never needed to field. 
Um, and, and, and so that's the case that I'm making is that, that we're, we're grossly out of balance and that we stand to gain a lot by correcting that. In your book, you talk about uh, three main barriers to upstream thinking, which are uh, problem blindness, lack of ownership, and tunneling. Uh, so I'd like to spend a couple of minutes maybe talking about um, what these barriers are so we can start with problem blindness. Um, so maybe you can explain what it is, uh, if you have any examples of what that might look like, and any advice or suggestions for how people might be able to overcome that particular barrier. Yeah, so let me kick this off with a, just a quick story. There's a guy named Marcus Elliott who was an MD that got interested in athletic training. So – in 1999, Elliot gets hired by the New England Patriots, and he's brought in to help solve a, a problem that they've had, which is a lot of their players have gotten hamstring injuries. In fact, there were 22 injuries that the year before Elliot came in. And, you know, you have skilled players like wide receivers going down with a hamstring injury. It can just wreak havoc with your team. And so at the time, the the the, the lore in professional sports was basically, well – it was just a bad run of luck, right? Football is its a dangerous game. People are colliding with each other at high speeds. People are going to get hurt. That's just the way it is. But Elliot had a very different philosophy. His point of view was that, that injuries were often the result of poor training. And so when he came in to the Patriots, he made a couple of changes. Number one, the idea at that time was you make – players better by making them bigger and stronger you know picture the kind of stereotypical weight room scene with people pumping you know giant quantities of iron and bench pressing and squatting and so forth and and Elliot's point of view was look these players have very different jobs they need very different uh, training programs and and even beyond that even within the group of people who are wide receivers they have very different natural assets and they have different natural imbalances so he would do things like measure the strength of, of one receiver's left hamstring versus right hamstring. And then he would custom design a training program for the receivers that seemed most likely to be in danger of getting an injury. Because there are predictable aspects to injuries, like muscle imbalances are a predictor of injury. So Elliot comes in and does all this thing, and some people are kind of skeptical of this. It seems a little bit like mumbo-jumbo. And then the next season, they have three hamstring injuries. And people start to become believers in this. And, and these days, this is utterly the norm. I mean, this kind of analysis and this kind of injury prevention work. And, and so what I want to point out about that story is, number one, this, this element of problem blindness, which says we can't solve a problem when we don't perceive it as a problem. And so that initial mindset in the NFL and on, on the Patriots that was sort of like, well, Injuries are just something that's going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. It's just a function of playing this dangerous game. That's problem blindness. And when we don't code things as problems, we're certainly not going to fix them. So it took Marcus Elliott to come in and say, no, this thing that you're coding as natural or inevitable is actually fixable, that we actually have agency here. And he was the one to demonstrate that and kind of pierce the problem blindness and show the solution. And, and I promise you there's something in – wherever it is that you work, there's something that you're problem blind about. You know, Expedia, it was the uh, the calls to the call center. You know, for years they just thought, well, we're doing a lot of transactions. People are doing complicated things with hotels and flights and, of course, people are going to call the call center. But it wasn't an of course. And it took Ryan O'Neill and his boss, Tucker Moody, to come along and say, hey, wait a second. A lot of the stuff that they're doing we can actually prevent. Uh and, and I think what it takes for organizations to work through problem blindness is someone like a Marcus Elliott or a Ryan O'Neill to shine a light on something and say, hey, this thing that we're just reacting to, this thing that we're just managing is something we could prevent with the right solution. So that's, that's the first barrier to upstream thinking. Before COVID-19 sent most of us home to work, the workplace was already rapidly transforming. To help companies navigate this new reality, join Cisco WebEx for a live Future of Work marathon series with customers and industry experts. To sign up, go to virtualsummit.webex.com. Remote work, the future of work is now.
Also, I just released my free Future Leader Masterclass, where you can learn the skills and mindsets that 140 of the world's top CEOs say are crucial for future leaders. Get access to that at futureleadermasterclass.com. I love the, uh, um, I think you gave an example in the book of the gorillas for the radiologists and radiologists were supposed to look at uh, the scan to try to diagnose it. But in the scan, there was an image of a gorilla and most of the radiologists did not even see it. <laughs> exactly right. Which I and thought was the- insane. Like, cause I, <laughs> I noticed it right away. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of a cheat, right? That you uh, you figure there's a trick coming if there's some picture like that in a book. And, yeah, uh, may, maybe a lot of your listeners have have seen. This is a phenomenon called inattentional blindness, and probably the best known form of this is um, there's a there's an experiment called the invisible gorilla that some of you may have seen, where you you get this task. You're watching a video of some young people like passing basketballs around. I, oh, I've seen that. It's a YouTube. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can find this on YouTube. Yeah, I guess, how would you, I guess you could just find like a gorilla attention just, clip or something. Yeah, gorilla attention, attention probably gorilla. get you there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, should, should I get, I, I guess we've already sort of given away the spoiler. So if you're yeah. really spoiler sensitive, just skip ahead like 30 <laughs> seconds before the rest of you. The, the trick is that you're given an assignment to count the number of passes. And so you're like really focused on the screen and there's a lot of passes happening. So it takes up a lot of your attention. And meanwhile, there's a, a guy in a gorilla suit that comes into the middle of this basketball court and beats his chest and walks off. And the hilarious thing is at the end of this video, most people like didn't even see the gorilla uh, and, and they, they kind of don't believe it until you replay the video and you show them it was right there. And, and, and so metaphorically, what, what that tells us is we can get so kind of locked in to our day to do routines and we locked in on that little piece of the pie that's ours that we can just miss something really obvious that's happening right in our midst. Would you say this, because we hear this all the time, right? A lot of employees say that, uh, you know, I've just been so heads down, um, where they're just literally focusing on that one little thing that's in front of them. So maybe being heads down is not not a good thing to say and not a good thing to focus on. You got to have your, your head up a little bit and kind of looking around instead of just, you know, like an ostrich in the sand. Yeah, well, and this gets us to, to actually uh, the third um, barrier to upstream thinking, which is something called tunneling. So um, let me tell a, a quick study that relates to exactly what you just said. There's a woman named Anita Tucker who, uh, who once ran a frosting uh, factory for General Mills, but, but later got a PhD at Harvard. And for her PhD, she followed around nurses in hospitals, I mean, for hundreds of hours to shadow them to see what their life was like. And she chronicled that, that their work was was like a succession of of unexpected problems. They were always problem solving. You know, they they didn't have the medication that they wanted at the right time or a piece of equipment didn't work. Or uh, then there were really weird things like one day uh, there was a nurse that was checking out a woman who just had a baby and it was time for them to go home. And part of the checkout process is you've got to take off the the security anklet for the baby. But, But this baby didn't have one. And so they looked all around to try to figure out where it went, and it turned out it had just fallen into the baby's bassinet. So problem solved. The the woman could check out and go home. And then the weird thing was about three hours later, the same problem happened to a different woman, different baby. This time they couldn't find the anklet at all, and so the nurse told her supervisor about it, and they figured out a different way to securely check out the woman from the hospital. And so that was the kind of thing that happened in the life of a nurse. And and Anita Tucker observes that these nurses were resourceful and they were improvisational in solving problems and, and they took a lot of pride in being independent. You know, they didn't need to run to their boss every time something went wrong. And and when I paint that portrait, it's pretty admirable. Like we, we like the idea of these resourceful, uh, cheeky, improvisational nurses. But from an organizational point of view, the tragedy here is this is the description of an organization that will never improve, that will never learn. Because when you constantly work around problems, you by definition are not solving them, which means that you're dooming yourself to solving the same problem the next week. You know, it didn't dawn on this nurse who'd had two mothers in three hours where security anklets uh, disappeared to say, hey, there's a systemic problem here. 
Now, I want to be clear that that I'm not throwing stones at nurses at all here. Uh, I think that this is actually a core problem that relates to every profession. I think Anita Tucker could have uh, shadowed consultants or, or flight attendants or, or chefs and found exactly the same conclusions. And this is a phenomenon that I call tunneling in the book. And, and tunneling is, is a word that I stole from a book called Scarcity, which is a wonderful uh, psychology book, if you like that sort of thing. And the authors say that when we're dealing with scarcity, you know, scarcity of resources or scarcity of time, which is most of us, either one or the other or both, that, that we kind of give up trying to systematically solve problems. And we adopt this, this tunnel vision where we just want to keep going forward. We just want to move. And if we hit an obstacle, if we hit a barrier, we just want to get it behind us so we can keep moving. And that's the nurses. You know, if they ran out of towels, they would just run to the, the unit down the hall and steal some of their towels. You know, that let them keep going, keep responding to patients. If an anklet falls off a baby, they run around for it, they find it, they keep going. But, but Anita Tucker's shock was that she couldn't find a single instance of systemic problem solving in all of her shadowing. And I think that's exactly what we're up against when we try to move upstream is that our schedules are so overloaded that we're so locked in, head down, as you said, that, that we kind of forget that, that there's even another mode to be in. And yet if we want our work to improve – it has to be at that level. It has to be at the level of stamping out problems rather than just uh, reacting to them again and again. When you think of uh, problem blindness, for example, because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of employees get very frustrated, for example, when they have a solution to something or when they see a problem and they think they know the answer to it and they try to present it and, you know, we've all been turned down and shut down. Um, and then oftentimes a lot of people either just give up or they get frustrated and they say, oh, you know, I don't understand why, why my leader doesn't understand this. You know, I got this perfect solution. But it occurs to me that maybe in a lot of those situations, uh, what happens is the employee does not understand what the actual problem is, right? I mean, we, mm. we, we give up without actually saying, you know, why are you turning this down? Um, why don't you think this is worthy of, of being funded or something like that? So it's mm -hmm. one possible way of getting over problem blindness is just asking the right questions or even just spending time with a broader network of people outside of like your core function? I, I think that's a really insightful point that, yeah, I mean, back to this notion of, of what level are you solving problems at? Are you the, the call center rep who's solving for minimizing call time or are you a level or two up thinking about how could we prevent calls altogether? I think that you're you're right to suggest that we be cautious with our own pet ideas. You know that that one way to to test ourselves and figure out like, hey, do we have the right holistic conception of this problem? Is just to run it by a couple of colleagues in other functions. Um, you know, make sure you get an IT rep and an HR rep and an operations rep and a marketing rep together to kick the tires on something. And that's something that is not particularly complicated, right? You could all just go out to, to lunch one day and talk yeah. something over. But it, but it could be a really powerful way of just testing whether you're, you're intervening at the right level in the system. Well, even if, um, for example, you know, a lot of the times leaders might say no to things just because of fear. You know, they're scared of what this might mean for them. Maybe they feel that they don't have the knowledge or the experience and they don't want to be made to look uh, stupid in front of their peers. And so if you as an employee don't understand that that's the true problem, you're going to beat your head against the wall, you know, forever uh, because you don't understand that the leader is dealing with uh, these issues of fear. And that's that's a really good point, actually, is, is I remember Marcus Elliott telling me, you know, he comes in with his, you know, fancy pant customized training. And keep in mind, I mean, there there's some people who who may not whether it's conscious or, or my suspicion is unconscious kind of don't want him to succeed, right? I mean, if, if you're the, the trainer in the weight room who's like the bench press guy, uh, you don't really understand this, this new tailored medicalized approach to, to training. And so you're going to be, it's going to, you're going to have to be a pretty big person to say the way that I've always learned to train athletes is wrong. And, and I got to get up to speed on this thing that I don't really have the training to understand. That's a pretty big ask. 
And so, you know, that, I think that's a good example of some of the barriers we're up against. Yeah, for sure. And um, I remember uh, Beth Comstock, the former vice chair of GE, she was telling me this story of how uh, when she used to work at NBC Universal, she she had this idea for something that she wanted to do. And I don't remember all the exact details, but she had this idea for something that she wanted to do. And she kept trying to pitch it to her leaders. And, uh, you know, her direct uh, manager at the time was like, no, I'm sorry, it's not going to work. And she would say, OK, why is it not going to work? And he would give her feedback and she would improve and then she would go pitch it again. And again, the leader would say, I'm sorry, it's still not going to work. And she would say, OK, tell me why it's not going to work. And then she would keep going back to this leader until finally the leader said yes. And Beth was, she told me she was shocked. She's like, why did you say yes? And the leader said, because you made it impossible for me to say no. <laughs> and I love that story because she kept trying to understand what the problem was. Like, what is the issue? Why are you saying no? Well, you know, what uh, what can I do? And, you know, she, she really, um, it was just kind of a, a motivating and inspiring story of, you know, when you're told no, try to really understand what that problem is and keep trying to tweak and go back instead of just giving up. Well, I, I like what you're, you're kind of honing in on, which is really problem definition. You know, what's the old cliche about if, I, I, this is attributed to Einstein. It was probably just like somebody uh, made it up on the internet. But if, if I had 24 hours to solve a problem, I'd spend 23 hours defining the problem and an hour solving it. Oh yeah. yeah. I feel like that, that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. And, and I do want to be clear. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about the barriers to upstream thinking, but, but please don't think this book is just like a big buzzkill of the gauntlet of pain you're going to run and going <laughs> upstream. Like this, this is a book of solutions so all the things we're talking about here, I mean, there are ways around them. Like uh, here's a business example of, of, of where people are able to overcome some of these things we've talked about. Um, comes from LinkedIn. And uh, years ago, they were selling, as they continue to sell now, a subscription product to employers for recruiting. So you know, if you want to hi go hire a software developer, you can obviously subscribe to LinkedIn's recruiting uh, software. And it's an annual subscription. And at the time, the, the way it worked was right around month 11, you know, about a month out from the critical renewal date, because if you run a subscription business, boy, renewal is the thing you probably care more about than anything else. Uh, about month 11, they would start to, to look at their accounts and see, OK, which ones haven't been very active lately? Let's swoop in in this final month and save the day. You know, that was the, the instinct, this kind of heroics. And... Um, a friend of mine, Dan Shapiro, who was the the, the sales boss at that time. Dan Dan was actually a podcast guest, and uh, oh, you're kidding! Cool. Yeah, and for so for my new book that came out a few weeks ago, The Future Leader, um, LinkedIn and Dan Shapiro's team were the folks who are responsible for helping me survey 14,000 LinkedIn members around the world. So oh, I, wow! Yes, yeah, so I know. Uh, I know Dan. Small world. Yeah, I know Dan and his team well, so I'm uh, glad you guys know him as well. Well, now you know him as a story protagonist as well. So yes. Here, uh, so, so Dan says, you know, is there any way we could get earlier warning of who is going to churn? And so they, they crunch the data. They, they've had the data all along. They've just actually never analyzed it this way. And they're astonished to find out that they can get a pretty good sense of who's going to churn and who's going to renew at about week four in the subscription. So like one month into the subscription – they can predict who's going to renew 11 months later and who's going to turn 11 months later, which is just weird. And so they start thinking about what's going on here. And, and they dig into the data some more and eventually come up with this insight that, that with LinkedIn, and, and I suspect this is true of a lot of other subscriptions, by the way, but, but at least we have the data for LinkedIn. People kind of either got value out of the product right away. Or they just never did. They they never they never locked in, and so it was an easy decision by month twelve not to renew. And so Dan's insight was, why don't we get out of the business of like heroics? Why don't we get out of the business of saving the day and and get into the business of stopping the day from needing to be saved? And so they transferred a bunch of resources early in the process to onboarding. So every customer now. Uh, has their hand held through here's how you set up a job search and here's the way it works and here are the kind of outreach emails that we've seen be really successful we're going to help you draft your first one and and it made a huge difference it, it cut churn in half in a period of 
of about a year or two, which at the scale LinkedIn operates is just a massive, massive win. I mean, certainly yeah, it's huge. Ten, tens of millions of dollars in profit from that. Yeah, and so that's an example of upstream thinking, right? It's like, how do we get out of the business of just reacting to customer dissatisfaction right around the deadline? And how do we get into the business of, of preventing that dissatisfaction from ever materializing? Yeah, I like that story a lot. Um, well, the one barrier that we didn't touch on um, was lack of ownership, which I think is also a very, very important one and probably something a lot of people struggle with. Uh, so can you touch on that one briefly? Yeah. In, in fact, one of my favorite examples of this is a is an interpersonal example. I, I met this woman named Jeannie Forrest, who's an administrator at Yale Law School, and she said she had this um, this staff dispute that she had to navigate as a boss at one point. And so uh, I'll disguise these women's names, but uh, w one woman was Dawn, um, who reported to another woman, uh, Barbara, the boss. And Dawn had filed a complaint about Barbara, saying that Barbara was undermining and belittling her. And so anyway, this eventually reached Forrest's desk. And so Forrest brought the two women together, Dawn and Barbara. And, and Forrest started the meeting by saying, I'm the one accountable for this. You know, I, I'd heard rumors all along that you weren't getting along. And, um, and I did nothing. I, I buried my head in the sand. I thought maybe it would go away. And so that was my fault. I apologize. And then Forrest turned to the two women. She said, I'd like each of you to tell the story of this situation we're in as though you're the only one in the world responsible for where we are. And so, you know, first the, uh, the boss, Barbara, takes a crack and she says, well, every time I try to give you instructions, Don, you shut me down and you ask a bunch of unnecessary questions. And Forrest said, you know, Barbara, that sounded an awful lot like you were blaming Don. You want to try that again and, and, and you take ownership of this? And so Barbara said, well... You know, I interpreted her questions as though they were mean-spirited. I, I didn't think they were sincere. And I could have just explained what I wanted uh, better and not uh, made assumptions. That was on me. And so then Dawn jumped in and said, well, I just accepted her huffing her and her eye rolling. And, and I didn't address it. I just got mad. And I should have said, look, you're huffing at me and I really don't understand what you want. Just help me understand it better. That's on me. And so by the end of the meeting, they emerged with a kind of detente situation, you know, calm down. And, and I, I thought about this about six weeks later and I pinged Jeannie Forrest because I was curious what had happened with the two. It, this was something that had just happened when I spoke to her. And she wrote me back and said, they're working together productively and cheerfully. It's a little insane. And, and so that's an example of something that – that I talk about as a lack of ownership. Like this was a situation where all three of the people involved in, in this dispute felt like they were kind of trapped in it, that, that it was something that had happened to them. But with this simple prod, the one that Forrest used of, of figuring out how to explain the situation as though they were the only one responsible for it, all of a sudden they start to identify these levers these levers of action that were actually there all along to identify they have influence in the situation. They have agency. They just weren't using it. And, and I think the same metaphor goes for a lot of different situations where, you know, earlier I used the thought experiment of whose job is it to keep your house from, uh, from catching on fire? Is it the homeowner? Is it the people who write building codes? Is it the people who built your house? Is it the fire department? And imagine if every one of those agents were asked that same question, you know, tell the story of house fires as though you're the only one responsible. You know, what would the homeowner say? What could they do as if, if there wasn't even a fire department, what would you do to make your house safer? And, and the, the building, building codes people, people if, if you couldn't count on anybody, anybody else, else to be responsible, responsible what, what would you, you do with building codes, codes to make sure the homes were safe? And so on and so on. I love the way that this takes uh, levers of action that were, that were there all along but buried and, and finds a way to kind of surface those, those strands of causation. And so I would, I would challenge people listening to this. If there's some kind of problem that you're encountering at work or at home, maybe it's even in a relationship. You know, could you tell the story of your relationship problems as, as if you were the only one responsible or the story for some 
customer dissatisfaction as though your customer as though your your business unit perhaps was the only one responsible that's what we're getting at with this this unit on the lack of ownership it reminds me a lot of a uh, uh, an exercise that therapists use and some people might be familiar with this uh, we have a lot of therapists in my family so I'm quite familiar with this but you know during couples therapy oftentimes if you go see a therapist the uh, and you know couples usually blame the other person uh, and that the therapists usually say you you have to say I like mm. you know you talk about I feel um, when you do this I feel like this instead of you know you're doing this you're doing this it's you you really bring it back to yourself all the time and it's a, ooh that's good yeah yeah so it reminds me a lot of this of like you know take some ownership and take a stance in there um, and I like your visual of pretend you're the only one in there who can um, kind of take action to that yeah yeah um. So, in lack of ownership, I mean, oh, I think the examples there are pretty easy. Uh, we've seen lots of them. Uh, but I know we only have a couple minutes left, so I wanted to transition maybe to just a couple of the questions that you have in your book. Uh, you talk about seven questions for upstream leaders, and, you know, of course, we, we won't be able to get to all seven. Uh, but do you have a couple questions in here that are your favorite um, or ones that you think are, I don't know, more impactful than the others? Let me share just a couple just to give you a flavor for, for what's in the book. So, so one of the questions is, and, and these are questions, by the way, that, uh, that upstream leaders should be asking themselves. And so one is, how can you get early warning of the problem? If we want to prevent problems, it sure helps to have more runway. And so that's really the LinkedIn story, right? If, if we can predict four weeks into a subscription whether people are in danger of churning, it gives us a lot of ability to change that course Another one is, is how do we unite the right people? Uh, back to this notion of focus can be an in, um, enemy and an ally. Often to solve upstream problems, we need to unite people across groups, across silos, across organizations. And so that's the Expedia story. You know, when you realize that it, it may only take one call center rep to, to respond to a complaint about a missing itinerary, but it may take three or four groups working together to prevent that customer from needing to call and then, and then another one, maybe the, the third and, and final I'll highlight is, is where can you find a point of leverage? So uh, upstream work is systems work, and systems are complicated. Systems have lots of variables involved. So it's like, where do you, where do you poke in the system? And how do you know you're picking a spot that's not going to cause enough unintended negative consequences to outweigh the good you're doing? So in the, story, in the book, I, this is a long story, I won't tell it now, but... Uh, I tell the story of how Chicago public schools managed to dramatically increase the graduation rate from like 52% to 78%. I mean, just an astonishing win in a system that is that is enormous. And and one of the most important parts of their victory was they figured out that the ninth grade year was the critical leverage point. And that if you could take a student who was kind of at risk uh, – uh, and in fact, they had some early warning technology that they used too, where they could predict who was off track in the ninth grade. If you could nudge them back on track in the ninth grade, chances are they would graduate successfully. And so even in big complicated systems, we can often find points of leverage to have outsized outcomes. Maybe last question for you before I ask you where people can uh, uh, grab your book and learn more about you is uh, what happens if you're not in a leadership role? Um, so you don't have the, you know, the usual authority or the power or the resources or the budget that, you know, a typical leader might have. Uh, any advice or suggestions for those people? Yeah, well, I think the thing about what we're talking about is there there are multiple levels of, of upstream. And so, you know, you're certainly right that there are some kinds of upstream work in organizations where you're going to have to have sign off by, by C-level folks. But but there are others that, that are much smaller. And in fact, there are a lot that are even personal. Like uh, some of my favorite examples were, were people that discovered recurring problems in their own lives and just did something about it. Like there was this guy, Rich Marisa, who, who had this ongoing um, argument with his wife. I guess all couples have these little things that they bicker about. But Rich and his wife, they bickered about the hallway light. So Rich was always going in and out of the house and, you know, taking the dog out and he would flick the hallway light on to get some light and he'd come back in, but forget to turn it off. And that bugged his wife. And so 
uh, one day Rich just realized he had this epiphany that that he could solve this. All he had to do was go to Home Depot, buy a $15 piece of hardware called a, a light timer switch. And uh, it, it has buttons on it where you can select five minutes of light or 10 minutes of light or 15 minutes of light. And now when he goes outside, he just presses a button, light comes on. He doesn't even have to remember. The light turns itself off. And that argument is gone forever from their relationship. And it's a little thing, right? I mean, it's not like they were on the cusp of divorce about this dumb hallway light argument, but it was an irritant, an irritant that they had adapted to that they never had to adapt to. And I think work is full of those things in your life individually, in your team's life. You know, there are meetings and and annoying uh, meeting practices that you have adapted to that you needn't have adapted to. What the, the most absurd one and hilarious one I came across was this woman told me she had just been moved physically within her office. So she had just like taken over a new desk and her desk was, was right by a stairwell door, you know, and they're often reinforced. Uh, so they're heavy doors and this thing just creaked like crazy, and it it, it drove her nuts. Uh, and and of course, a lot of the people around had kind of adapted to it. And a couple of days of this thing just distracting her, she finally just brought in a can of WD-40 from home, and and generously lubed up the hinges on the door. All of a sudden, it was quiet, just you know, perfectly quiet. And she said her uh, office mates treated her like she had come down from on high. They were just just in awe that she had solved this problem. It, and I think that's a great example of where our capacity to adapt as human beings is actually maybe a little bit overpowerful, that, that we adapt to things in, in our, our lives, lives and in our work and, and, and even in, in, in our country, country uh, that, that we, we needn't have, have adapted to, to that we could have solved with just a little bit of forethought. I love that story. It reminds me of... Uh... I keep getting these weird visuals from movies. Did you ever see the original Men in Black movie with uh, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember there was that one scene where they have to take a test and they're sitting in these like circular chairs and uh, there's a table in the middle of the room and everyone and everyone's trying to write their answers, answers on this piece of paper and they're like trying to hold the paper and write on it and they keep punct- puncturing holes through it and uh, Will Smith finally gets up and he drags this table from the middle of the room to his chair and just uses that, uh, you know, puts the paper on it to write the responses so he doesn't puncture the paper. And meanwhile, everyone's like trying to figure out, you know, how do we get this paper? You know, how, how can I write on it without damaging it? <laughs> and there's just this table sitting in the middle of the room that nobody thought of to just drag to themselves to use. And so I love it. It reminds me very much of that story of this lady who's just like, I'm just going to get WD-40 and, and take care of this. The WD-40 hero. I know. Yeah. It's- Exactly. It's kind of gotten it's kind of gotten in my head these kinds of stories. Now I feel like there's always this little uh, process active in my brain where I'm like, what else is a recurring irritant that I can try to like uh, conquer with this stuff? Uh, so anyway, uh, I hope I hope the same little process opens up in in your brain, whoever's listening to this. Yeah, I uh, uh, I am sure it will. And so, where can people go to learn more about you and the book? Uh, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? Please feel free to do so. Yeah, so you can um, uh, find the book anywhere they sell books, or if you want to learn more about the book, you can go to upstreambook.com, conveniently enough, and it will tell you everything you could ever want to know. Very cool. Well, again, Dan, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Again, my guest has been Dan Heath, and his brand new book is called Upstream, The Quest to Solve Problems Before They Happen. I had a chance to read it. It was fantastic. Uh, I highly recommend you grab a copy as well, and I will see all of you next week.